Yeah, well, let's get started. First off, HDR might not be what you think it is. It's not that weird thing that your mobile phone can do, crushing several exposures into one really weird image. If you're doing tone mapping, you're not doing HDR. When doing HDR, any kind of ICC-based color management is completely irrelevant. Because, well, HDR means having a huge dynamic range, depending on the hardware, between 0 and 1,000 nits. You can, if you're doing real HDR, which is, has only become possible in the past year, you can show effects like sun shining through a window. You can actually play with light. Instead of imitating paper, screens start imitating light. And you get way more colors. The H an HDR image has 10 to 16 bits per pixel, sometimes even 32, but that's not that relevant. So there's a lot of extra capacity for storing information to go beyond basic sRGB. We are calling this the, the, the HDR color space REC 2020 or DT.2020, and you have got a big gamut. More greens, more blues, more reds. It's a bit like if you start painting in HDR, it's, it's a bit like it's the 19th century again. Fatale blue, Catherine red, and Viridian green got discovered again. You've got way more colors in your paint box. That said, it's very early days. When we started the HDR project, uh, which we did together with Intel, um, Intel started bothering me about HDR and Krita. Uh, a couple of years ago. Hardware didn't exist back then. Specifications were very weird. Operating system support didn't exist. Um, late 2017, Windows started supporting, using, started supporting HDR displays. Unfortunately, there's no other operating system that supports HDR displays yet. The number of HDR displays is growing quite quickly, but when we started the project around April 2018, uh, the display, the hardware I ordered, couldn't be delivered until September, which put a bit of, of, of a delay in our schedules. HDR monitors, HDR displays, uh, come in three classes. Um, there are actually two competing standards, Dolby HDR and Visa HDR, but only Visa HDR is relevant because that's what's supported by the OS. So don't get taken in by Lenovo. They think that X1 Yoga with HDR screen is Dolby HDR, it's useless. Intel is working on Linux drivers, but that's apparently a very long story. So we had to use Windows for this. Um, if you want to know which displays can display HDR content, go to the displayhdr.org website and get a supported uh, display. So, I'm trying, I will try to get to that animation run. The problem, of course, is I haven't, I haven't got network here. Uh, the, pro the problem is I can't show you any HDR content without an HDR display. Um, a projector like this one will never be able to show HDR content in HDR. Where did my slide notes go? It's only when you're sitting at an HDR-capable system that you will discover how wide your new capabilities will be. Um, traditional displays are, are calibrated uh, like they're a sheet of white paper illuminated by a source of light matching the D65 standard, like average midday light in Western Europe. So 
what do you really need to get started? That's an HDR capable monitor, just cover that. Uh, you need to have a latest version of Windows 10. You need to have an HDMI cable or a display cable, display port cable. In my experience, an HDMI cable doesn't work because you will get red ghosting around every black pixel. Early days. Uh, NVIDIA works fine. I have no idea about AMD. Uh, you really need to check the compatibility of your hardware because some monitors only work with NVIDIA others only work with Intel. Then uh, you get started to painting. It's, it's a bit of a hassle. So these are the instructions to actually get started and then you can start painting. The act of painting in HDR is really fun. It's, it's like you're painting with light. Um, you can use it for really subtle effects, like I've seen an HDR image, a winter landscape, and all that HDR did was show the snowflakes reflecting light as real light. On a theoretical level, your HDR image could be constructed as being scene referred instead of display referred. Like you're working with the light as it is in the scene instead of working to the display. You're not painting the reflection of light anymore, you're trying to paint the light. Um, all this would be pretty useless if you couldn't save it, and that's another area where it's early days. So, Creative Native Format can of course save anything you can do in Creative. If you want to interoperate with other applications, there's the OpenEXR format, which has existed for a very long time. Krita has actually supported creating HDR content uh, using OpenEXR since 2005. It just turned out that it was impossible to see your HDR content in one go. You would have to fill with the exposure slider, check your uh, image at different exposures. Uh, Voltaire actually painted HDR images using that method. Uh, so when we finally had got Krita working and showing HDR content in HDR, we could finally check those images as they were intended. That was a really cool moment. There's the extended ping format, which can be used to share your images. Um, it's not a finished standard yet, uh, but it's a bit more finished than extended JPEG, which is not implementable at all at this moment. So Krita supports that. And then the latest builds of FFmpeg can take those extended ping images and create an animation, an HDR animation, from those images. And you can upload that to YouTube, and YouTube handles HDR content. And then probably, if your phone is fancy, you can watch the HDR content in HDR on, for instance, your phone, or your, your television set, if your television set supports HDR. So, how did we do this? Hacking is fun. Well, this was quite tough. There were a lot of components that we had to really hack about. In theory, it's pretty simple. You use DirectX because that's the only API that supports getting the metadata from the monitor and sending information about each image to the monitor. Uh, you create a swap chain with a 10 or 16 bit uh, pixel format, then you set the color space of the swap chain to P2020PQ if you're working in 10 bit mode or SCRGB for 16 bit mode. You make sure that all your textures, surfaces, all your image data is rendered in 10 or 16 bit mode because you don't want to go from 32 bits to 10 bits and you can't upscale from 8 bits to 10 bits per channel. Now, there's another wrinkle. If you're doing DirectX or OpenGL, your GUI elements like the buttons and, and menus and things like that are rendered in the same, in the same surface as your image, as your canvas. So you have to convert the paint, what your, your GUI widget painting code does, you have to convert that to the same color space as you're using for your canvas. All in all, we had to do uh, a lot of work. So you might be lucky if you're using OpenGL and there's another HDR rendering application running on the same monitor, your application might accidentally be able to render 
HDR content. But you're missing out on all the metadata, so you can't actually figure out what the screen is capable of. So you have to use DirectX. Now, Cricut doesn't use DirectX, just like we don't use Metal. Uh, we use OpenGL, and maybe in the future we, we use Vulkan, but we are not going to do all those proprietary things. So we have, uh, we use a layer between OpenGL and DirectX, so we can use the APIs after all. That layer is called Angle. It was developed by Google for Chromium because OpenGL drivers on Windows are shit. They are really horrible. They have given me hours, days, months of bugs. Uh, at one point, with some Intel chips, if you use OpenGL instead of Angle, my, my users would get a black canvas. So Angle is a godsend. We use Angle as our intermediate uh, format intermediate API and we had to extend angle to get the, the, the uh, to get to the HDR API um, so then there's a difference you, you we need to ask which color space we want to use I said you can choose either rec 2020 PQ or we can use SCRGB well SCRGB with a linear uh, tone response curve is easier to work on for artists so we choose to let people work in that format, and then we would convert that for display. So then we had to hack Qt, because Qt internally, well, Qt externally, Qt, the Qt APIs, tell you, will tell you that it supports, uh, for instance, 10-bit integer uh, uh, OpenGL buffers. Internally, it will convert everything to 8-bit, so we have to hack that out and make sure that whatever we feed Qt's OpenGL API will stay the format we choose for it. And then we had to make sure that we could use Qt to tell the system what we were going to render. So we hacked the create window surface method so it could support color space selection, and then we could pass that as the default surface format. And then we had to make sure that everything we rendered with QPainter. QPainter is Qt's equivalent of Cairo. It's a 16-bit integer channel uh, 2D painting library. We had to make sure that everything that was rendered with QPainter, like buttons and widgets, were converted from sRGB to the display color space at the right brightness level. Because that's another issue. If you have this range between one between zero and a thousand nits, between really black and ice cream inducing bright, brighter even than this lamp here, then uh, you have to fiddle your, your, your GUI brightness, which is in fact SDR, not HDR content, so it's comfortable. Uh, there's a setting for that in Windows, then you have to get that setting from Windows, and then you have to convert all your, your, your widgets to the right brightness level. That's actually something that's a bit of a struggle right now, because Windows doesn't remember those settings correctly. Windows doesn't apply those settings correctly to individual applications. So sometimes Krita's GUI just gets a bit too dark. Sometimes it gets a bit too bright. Like I said, this is early days. Krita right now is the only content creation application that does HDR with HDR displays. We are still figuring that out. And of course, you need a color selector. Color selectors are, are, are mostly sRGB based, at least in Krita. So we had to create a color selector with an uh, exposure slider so you could go from dark to light. Color selector still got a few bugs. But it's usable. People are using it. We extended Q Windows Native Handle Interface API to fetch all the information from Windows I was just talking about and tests show that we indeed get weird stuff now and then. So, what's up next? I'm pushing Intel to support HDR on Linux. It shouldn't be too hard for them. They're working on it. Mac OS, 
I doubt that will happen anytime soon. I mean, macOS likes its walled garden. Uh, there are no Macs with HR capable screens at this moment. Um, I don't see that happen. I'm not too interested anyway. Uh, I see a rapid growth in hardware. I've seen the first laptop with true display HDR panel announced. It's going to be a Dell MXPS 13, which is pretty because that's a model without a panel. It would be nice to be able to take your HDR capable painting computer outside in the sun and start painting, but I'm sure that will come. The list of, of available monitors displays is getting too long to fit into one uh, uh, screen full of, 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 of links. Um, what's uh, turning out to be quite a bit of work is getting our patches merged upstream into cute and angle. But that's quite normal when we had a fixed QPainter to support OpenGL 3 core profile two years ago, three years ago already. It took about a year to get it merged, so I'm confident it will happen. And then everyone who develops using Qt can create a true HDR capable application. There are some bugs, of course. Right now, as far as I know, there are only two people in the whole universe who have created HDR content in Krita. They're sitting over there. <laughs> and we will have to make some more features compatible with HDR. Right now our gradients are 8-bit integer per channel, which is not good enough. That's something we can work on. Uh, some of our filters work, but most don't really work. Uh, brushes work fine. There are some bugs with blending modes, probably something like overflow. Uh, all that is planned to happen after we release Krita 4.3. Krita 4.3 is for September, October. We are still going to have a couple of months fixing bugs. We just released Krita 4.2, which means that people are finally testing our new, our new version. I don't know whether that's the same for, for other projects, but our office and betas, we make uh, nightly builds, they hardly get tested, there are no release, and suddenly everyone finds bugs. <laughs> so, I kept the introduction short because I was expecting questions, and I see that I still have quite a bit of time for questions. So, questions. Go ahead. I couldn't hear you. It's right. So the question is, what color management engine do we use for HDR content? Uh, we use Open Color IO, so we can have. Uh, we're, so let, let's let's take a step back. Uh, we use little CMS for our ICC based workflow, which is the traditional work, uh, color management workflow uh, originally meant for publication on paper. Uh, years ago, we added Open Color IO. Open Color IO uh, comes from uh, the movie industry. It's an advanced system that will allow you to emulate looks of different kinds of, of, of uh, uh, projection technologies. It supports a floating point and, and HDR by default. Um, the, the thing is that color management in HDR is, is, is a bit of a gray area. So we use Open Color IO, but Open Color IO is actually meant to take HDR content and show it at a certain exposure, at a certain uh, level. So I've been wondering whether it's not actually more accurate to say that. Uh, HDR content is not really color managed. It's, you've got the REC 2020 PQ color space. We know how to convert from SC RGB to uh, REC 2020. That's done using Open Color uh, There's no way to accurately profile an HDR display, so you just have to uh, hope that it's going to be okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what is going to happen in a couple of years when our displays degrade. Um, 
start showing colors in a weird way because these displays they use a lot of energy and I would guess that gives a lot of wear and tear on the panels. Well, I think uh, with the Arduino project there is some discussion about uh, the topic of HDR profiling. Where is the discussion going on? Uh, in the Arduino community. Right, in Argo. I will subscribe to uh, better. I will ask you need to subscribe to that list. <laughs> then, this, go ahead. Um, on the pixels.us forums, there is a discussion about wavelength and color profiling. And currently, they discuss how a protocol should look like profile display. And they took HDR into, into account to see how to do that because it's whatever they need to send to the compositor, uh, compositor to the HDR display, they probably will use the same protocol, and that's where the discussion is going on. If you are not aware of that... I, I was not aware of that. It's so the... the, the uh, still ongoing. It's a huge threat. Uh, let, let, let me repeat that for the uh, video. So on the pixels.us forum, uh, people are discussing wayland and color management, and they're taking HDR into account. Uh, that, that, of course, presupposes that color management is something that should be done in the display compositor. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of torn about that, because uh, we've tried that before with window managers on X11, and the results were not always that good. Uh, the, the problem is if you are writing a color managed application, you don't want to have to, you don't want the compositor or the window manager to mess with your pixels. Anyone else? Go ahead. Do you think that HDR is interesting for vector artwork creation? And if so, what advice would you give? What, what to watch out for? Okay, so the question is: Is HDR interesting for vector art? Uh, I would say HDR is interesting for every sort of art because it gives you all these new colors to play with. You can go way outside of what used to be possible. Uh, why wouldn't it not be interesting? It's, it's uh, look, looking at this from, from an artist's point of view, you get a whole new box of toys to play with. Uh, go ahead. Do you need HDR to use those uh, larger chromaticities that are in the BT2020? Yes. You it's, it's, I, I, I guess that technically it could be possible to have those, the, the larger, let me go back to the slide. Now I'm going. Far one, it's yeah. So theoretically, of course, you could have the 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 the, the Rec twenty twenty color space without the extra dynamic range. But I'm not aware of any displays that give you Rec twenty twenty gamut without also giving you a larger dynamic range. Go ahead. Uh, do the HDR displays actually achieve full Rec 2020, or do they just properly convert Rec 2020 input to whatever they're capable of and clip or roll off the color that they exceed the screen? So the question is, do display manufacturers cheat? Do they really implement the full Rec 2020 gamut, or are they secretly and deviously converting back to whatever they build? The answer is, I don't know. I haven't measured it. I wouldn't be surprised at all. There's a huge variety in, in price points at this point. There are also three levels of HDR support, 400 nits, 600 nits, 1,000 nits. And then there are really professional monitors that can go up to 30,000, but I haven't seen those. I would expect cheaper monitors to fudge. Last, last question? Oh. <laughs> well, you go ahead. Do you have contact with Netflix? Because they have a lot of articles about how they create HDR content for the uh, menus. I'm, no, no. I'm, I'm not in touch with Netflix, uh, except that Intel gave me their uh, uh, 
white papers and, and research papers to read. I haven't got contact there. Uh, this was the last question, so thank you very much. Thank you.